we have to figure out how we build and share power, how we listen to people on the ground and co-create with the individuals we're working with to make the kind of changes that benefits them. There's something in the spirit of this that frankly can appeal to both liberals and conservatives. This is not just a small pilot project here and there. This is about rewiring the economic system for social, economic, and ecological justice. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Fuck. Low wages, precarious jobs, towns with shuttered main streets and bleak futures. Is there an alternative to the sort of begging and pleading we see some cities engage in to tempt outside employers to invest in their people? Remotely owned corporations rarely stay long after the incentives run out, and the climate clock is ticking on how much slash and burn our neighborhoods can tolerate. In some places, local governments are experimenting with different strategies. So here is the good news. An approach called community wealth building is gaining traction around the world. It was even picked up by the federal government's Department of Housing and Development, or HUD, as a necessary component of the U.S. National Strategic Plan. More on that later. We have been following this story for a while, and it's taken us from Cleveland, Ohio, to Preston in Northern England, and today, we're going to get an update from even further afield. With public health, democracy, and climate at mission critical, is now liftoff time for community wealth building at a whole new scale? For that conversation, I welcome back to this program Ted Howard. He is co-founder and president of the Democracy Collaborative. And India Pierce Lee, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Collaborative, India is also senior vice president at the Cleveland Foundation in Ohio, a community foundation. Also with us, Neil McEnroy, who we last saw when he was heading up the Center for Local Economic Strategies, or CLES, in the UK. He's now the community wealth building advisor to the Scottish government and a colleague of Ted's. Welcome, everybody. It is a pleasure to have you with us. And I'm going to start with you, Ted, just one more time. Tell us what community wealth building is is well, a good way to think about it is to look at what kind of economic development do we have now in our cities and our states and it really is something that began about 40 years ago and um, to put it in a nutshell it's called trickle down economic development and the idea there is if uh, places just focus on growing the economy uh, the benefits will trickle down to everyone but the reality is that doesn't happen. And so community wealth building is, is really a different approach to economic development. It uses the assets a city has and leverages them or a state has for the benefit of the residents. So India, coming to you, just to fill people in a little bit on Cleveland. I mean, I was there for the Republican convention. Let's not talk about that experience. But I was shocked by the state of the city, actually. You think of Detroit, you think of Flint. I hadn't realized quite what shape much of Cleveland was in. Can you just describe the challenges your precious city was facing or is facing still? We have all the, you know, disparities, I think. But what people have finally begun to acknowledge uh, since 2020 that a lot of us have been fighting for, for decades is that understanding the root causes of every issue is tied to systemic and institutional racism. I mean, we talk about wealth building, we talk about building equity, we talk about disinvestment, but then we have to look at the policies, the, the practices that have, you know, plagued the redlining in our communities that have caused this, you know, um, decades and decades, and now we're trying to, you know, swim our way out of. Cleveland's model of local investment in community wealth building helped to inspire Matthew Brown, the leader of a similarly deindustrialized city across the Atlantic in Preston, England. I had a chance to talk with Brown in 2018. To be honest, I read about a lot of it on the internet and I thought, well, is that happening in America? You know, because the perception of uh, the American economy is often, I didn't realise things like that were happening in America. Linking what the public sector buys to having jobs which are democratic and in the ownership of the people who live within the community, I thought was really, really appealing. We started by going around six of our large anchor institutions, so 
initially we, we got them to uh, commit to things like paying a living wage but also shifting more of what they buy to the local economy so that's initially supported a lot of local businesses so the 75 million pounds which in 2016-17 was redirected towards Preston based suppliers what we're finding is that there's more people receiving the living wage we're now the best in uh, 14 district areas in Lancashire for people receiving £8.75 an hour or more but also things like the amount of jobs that are in the local economy we're now one of the best in Lancashire for the amount of jobs that are in the local economy compared to the amount of people who are within that local economy. These models of community wealth building are interesting because they are scalable and they're clearly spreading. On the west coast of Scotland, a few hundred miles north of Preston, the North Ayrshire Regional Council has picked up the idea as an alternative to some of the tourist-driven, trickle-down economics that's brought them this far. Neil, you were one of the advisors on that project. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's been happening in North Ayrshire? Surely, North Ayrshire is a very typical sort of post-industrial location on the west coast of Scotland. And it suffered under two main problems that Community Wealth Bond addresses. Firstly, the traditional regeneration or revitalization, as you call it, in the US, that payments to poor people uh, to solve their issues, that didn't seem to really dig right into the problems that those people were facing. And then as, then, as Ted mentioned before, the problems of economic development, this trickle-down economics. So let's get the factories in, let's get the investment in, and then we'll have a land of milk and honey. So both revitalization was failing, but also the traditional economic development model. And through enlightened leadership uh, in North Ayrshire, we've seen a comprehensive strategies to develop community wealth bond across many fronts in terms of public spending, in terms of workforce and workplace advancements, in terms of land and property and ownership of land and property, um, in terms of different forms of finance and how we use them effectively in the, in the new ecosystem, and also in terms of um, the uh, uh, progressive procurement and spending of public sector resources in that locality. A suite of activities which seek to address this uh, enduring problem of wealth and the extraction of wealth. Joe Cullinan, a member of the Scottish Labour Party, recently won re-election in North Ayrshire with community wealth building as a focus of his campaign. In five and a half years under his party's leadership, the council invested in council-owned solar farms and wind turbines built on an old waste dump, a community investment fund, and a large new house building program. This spring, Cullinan showed Ted Howard around the building site for those new homes. Okay, so this is a, a housing development, Ted, here in uh, Irvin Harbour site. There's uh, 73 council houses getting That's built here. Uh, it's part of the total house building programme, so 1,625 council houses. Uh, every development will have a range of, sort of sustainability measures. Solar panels will kind of be the, the standard ones, so as well as doing it on the new builds, uh, we are retrofitting our existing housing stock with solar panels to yeah. kind of improve their energy efficiency and reduce uh, tenants' energy bills. But there'll be a range of other sustainability measures in some of the houses as well. Well, Ted, coming back to you, in Scotland, as you saw, the Ayrshire Growth Deal, as it's known, is on track to create thousands of new jobs over the next decade. And millions of dollars in public and private funds are slated for local investment in community wealth building. Coming back to the U.S., where cities like Cleveland and others have faced year upon year of cuts to public spending, where does the money for community wealth building, for the investment, come from? Well, there are a number of sources, Laura, of resources to be invested in our community. On one hand, as, as we did, India and I and others in Cleveland, uh, we uh, worked with and persuaded what we call anchor institutions, large hospitals, universities, and so forth, to change their um, supply chain uh, requirements so that they could buy locally. So you could have tens, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent by these large institutions, but you look in the community and nobody in the community is getting a, a penny of it. So the, 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 the strategy was, let's look at all of our contracts 
coming up. Where are we buying goods and services, laundry services, food, energy, everything else? And how can we bring those uh, investment, those uh, spending back to the community? After all, the institutions have to buy anyway. Why not buy locally where they're rooted and can't leave and improve the community overall in the spirit of we're all in this together, the community and the anchor institution? More recently, cities and now the federal government are beginning to invest in community wealth building. The city of Chicago has just uh, a few months ago announced the first $15 million pilot investment of COVID relief funds that's going into a community wealth building model. Other cities are similarly uh, changing their budget. So New York City has a line item to support cooperative development right within the city's budget. And most recently, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the biggest funder of economic development in the United States, $68 billion budget this year, has built community wealth building for the first time into their new four-year strategic plan. It's very early days, of course. Now, the money hasn't yet started flowing through the Department of Housing and Urban Development for this. But the kinds of things that we're talking to them with is um, they award hundreds of millions many hundreds of millions of dollars to grants, uh, to, to cities, to nonprofit organizations, to anchor institutions. Can India, can this model address so like deeply entrenched racial injustice, segregation, racism? We have the right people leading that one, you know, put the right policies in place. And then also, how do we leverage the funding in a way? So we've been at this work now about 17 years. And, you know, over time, we have continued to evolve it, new partners. But what has culminated from this, again, unfortunately, it took all the events of 2020 to get people to really, really dig deep on this work. But then um, getting people to acknowledge that you have to pay people what they're worth, right, to create the kind of wealth. You know, we have this glut now, people leaving jobs and not coming back. We need to acknowledge that people need the same basic human needs. You know, it's not a, about um, a right. It should be that's everything for everyone, health care, good housing, you know, good public school systems. But really um, looking at how we democratize and educate our community so that they have ownership in the community. And we're doing, you know, some of those things on a small scale, but it's starting to take hold, not only here, but across the country, creating a land trust. You know, we have a Black Futures Fund that we created to support small nonprofit, um, Black-led organizations doing great work in the community, touching the people where they are. But it also means that we have to change the way we do business. We have to figure out how we build and share power, how we listen to people on the ground and co-create with the individuals we're working with to make the kind of changes that benefits them and not us telling them what they need. One of our first employees with the co-ops actually came to us and said, you know, he was a father of five. He had just got divorced, you know, and needed somewhere to have his kids. So he said, what about helping us get housing? So we looked at various models and worked with the local nonprofit Cleveland Housing Network, now Cleveland um, Housing Partners, who is the largest producer of affordable housing in the state of Ohio. And when they came to us, you know, talking about after the crash in 2008, they began self-financing. I said, we're trying to do this with Evergreen. So we gave them resources to uh, administer a housing program so employees of, of the co-ops could actually uh, buy a, a home and own it in five years. In what way can community wealth building, or is it already, helping our transition to a more uh, sustainable, greener economy. Neil? Well, clearly, community wealth bomb, part of its strategy is to um, shorten our supply chains for goods and services, and that helps with, the, with uh, our carbon footprint. So we need to repatriate elements, elements of our economy, uh, opposed to having these long supply chains that, that spin around the globe. Um, it's also worth saying that um, we are seeing in a number of places in the UK and Europe and in the States, and we're seeing uh, the um, a distributed energy network, which is much more localising energy systems from wind and so forth, particularly in Scotland, which is actually creating a more immediacy. We produce the energy 
um, nearer where we actually are using it. So that, that that's very important. Um, I think what is key about community wealth building is it nestles, if not snuggles, within a wider transformation approaches to our economy uh, that makes the transition. And the key heady brew, if you like, would be community wealth bond combined with a green industrial strategy, uh, which Scottish government is uh, uh, moving towards. So those big industrial transition questions is aligned with community wealth building strategies. Um, again, we're at the footholds of this, but certainly the the, the the thinking is there, the movement's starting to grow. We just need to move a bit faster. You Ted, how do you head off the danger that the kind of localism you're talking about, um, you know, increases segregation possibly or deepens it? What we're talking about is not going to exacerbate that problem. You know, community wealth building at its core is something that calls to people, you know, we're all in this together. It's very inclusive. Um, you know, the, the Evergreen cooperatives began in a very democratic city led by a democratic mayor, right? Uh, it's interesting that one of the very first replications of our Evergreen cooperative laundry is down in the panhandle in Texas in uh, Amarillo, which um, having visited there, I, it's uh, about the reddest place I've ever been. Um, there, there are no Democrats elected officials, but they say, you know, this just makes sense. Our hospitals, our laundry is being trucked even out of state to be cleaned. Let's build a, a, a local facility. Let's move it toward employee ownership, hire people in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods and keep our money local. So I think there's, uh, there's something in the spirit of this that frankly can appeal to both liberals and conservatives. Uh, and it's really about making a, a, a place for our community and making it a healthy place. And as India was saying, not just economically, but really for the whole person. And I think that's got to be a contribution to, to this country and where it's going. I was very impressed, Neil, by some of what I heard about how Preston had fared during COVID. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, because there's in many areas, including Preston, because there's a high uh, percentage of the economy is relational and cooperatives and those are those other democratic enterprises um when covid hit there was a an affinity to the place to the people and also there was not the huge extraction of profits that come from shareholder dividends in some of those enterprises so the incentives were more resilient uh, into to that particular shock and i think there's lessons there you know that uh, the types of economy the type of, the type of economy we're talking about is one that is in tune more with the people, in tune with society, in, in tune with the um, the problems they face. And it doesn't make the short-term shareholder profit decisions. It makes interests for the longer term. So there's something quite powerful about that uh, community wealth building in terms of the spirit of what an economy is. And of course, the word economy comes from the Greek word oikonomos, keeper of the household. It's something that should be close to our hearts, uh, close to our homes. Uh, the economy, is, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a social construction and we can construct it any way we want. And we're just talking here about making an economy that works for us. Hey, simple stuff. <laughs> what do you think is at stake, uh, India? And why do you care so much about this? If we do not get together and solve this, we're gonna continue to see the kind of poverty the disinvestment, um, the continue, you know, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, and this is just unacceptable. It's a, you know, everyone has the right to the same opportunities. And it's up to us to make sure that we're out here advocating, taking the resources we have where we sit to leverage that to really make a difference in people's lives. At the end of the day, you know, I used to tell people I only have this much space in the little space I live in. I want to help as many people as I can while I can. And, you know, and that means, you know, finding people like Ted, like Neil and others that are willing to stand up to fight the systems that exist, that continue to uh, disincentivize, that, um, you know, really takes away the opportunity to deepen civic participation from our citizens. 
I often end these programs by asking our guests the following question, and I'll, I'll ask it to you, Ted, first, but everybody, what do you think is the story the future will tell of this moment? You know, I think this is a, a true watershed moment, and there are key times um, in our lifetime, uh, you know, 1933 in the United States when the New Deal came in to force in the United Kingdom, 1945, right after the war and the advent of the labor government and the building of the National Health Service. And in a, I would think, a kind of negative way in 1979 and 80, when this neoliberal doctrine came in to dominate so many economies all over the world. And, you know, a situation where three people in the United States uh, control more wealth than the bottom 160 million of us, that's a prescription for tearing the country apart. And I think we've seen some of that in recent years. So I think this could be a watershed moment where 40 years of a certain way of dealing with the economy uh, over time is put to bed and we, and we build a new economy based on the democratic principle of ownership and participation. So I'm, while the times are perilous, uh, I'm very hopeful of, of where we're going. And you, India? Yeah, I'm, I'm always the optimist. And I believe that, you know, we have enough good people that will make the kind of changes that we're looking for. And again, you know, looking at opportunities to um, build on work that we've been doing for the last, you know, 17 years here at the foundation. You know, we are starting the land trust finally, Ted, uh, you know, things like that, that put wealth in people's hands. And, you know, when we go out to community now to like where we're building our new headquarters, engaging the community in a way, but paying them for their time, paying them for their advice, giving, you know, letting them know that they're important and that they are, you know, part of this process. And I think the solution is just us sticking together and continuing to fight the fight. I mean, Neil, I have to say the progress has been pretty quick with community wealth building. I mean, we're not talking centuries to gain some traction, but decades, not even very many. No, it's not glacial. In fact, we need to go faster uh, for sure because we've got a huge climate crisis as well as the whole other series of injustices that are taking place. But we need to seize the moment. And I think from community land trust in Chicago, from municipal ownership of energy, from to a whole series of different um, examples that fit into this community wealth building sort of framing, we need to learn those and we need to sing about them and we need to go again and harder and faster. I think that is, we need to seize this moment, but it's not we're seizing the intangible. It's all around us in many of our communities. We just need to get it to grow. And I think what's exciting about what's happening in many cities of the US, but also in Scotland, is that we're seeing administrations starting to pick up on this. We're seeing HUD in the US picking up on this. This, this could make it go a lot faster. As soon as we get that mainstream state apparatus supporting this, then we can go faster. So I think we're at the beginning, but we're nearly, we're just about to take off. That's my we, hope. We just need Beyonce to record a song. We do. Some some high profile celebrities getting behind Community Wealth Bomb would be great stuff. All right. If you're out there, anybody, um, just contact the folks at the Democracy Collaborative, I think is the answer. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure to 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 catch up with each of you and, and all of you together. Ted Howard, India Pierce Lee, and Neil McEnroy. It's really a pleasure. I, I enjoyed it very much. And I will be back in just a minute with just a few close closing thoughts. It hasn't been all smooth sailing for community wealth building around the world. In Scotland, Joe Cullinan won re-election this spring, but his party, the Scottish Labour Party, lost the majority on the council. So now they'll be working for community wealth building from opposition. But Neil McEnroy says the Scottish government and all the parties in the region are pretty persuaded of the benefits of the idea. We'll see how it goes. In the U.S., there's been tremendous growth, too, from that original 5.8 $8 million put into Cleveland's first 
evergreen cooperative laundry. We're now looking at a federal budget of $68 billion at HUD, some of which is tagged to go into community wealth building. More than anything, though, it's not just the money, it's the meaning that community wealth building gives to people in a place that I've seen make a difference. In Preston, for example, during COVID, people realized they could really help one another when they were in need. They've gone from thinking about themselves as a place lacking in resources and investment, lacking in what they needed, to a place looking at what they actually had and have where they are and how that can make a difference. And that, it seems to me, is an investment worth making, shifting people's spirits as much as shifting their economy. And with community wealth building, well, perhaps you can do both at once. We're going to continue following the story. You can find our past reports in our archives and our uncut conversations by subscribing to our podcast. All the information is at the website. Thanks for joining me. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.